We're so pleased today to be able to have Dr. Robert Sawyer, who's a professor of surgery at the University of Virginia, a paddlebillary specialist and intensivist. And he is also our past president and member of the Surgical Infection Society. And today, we're going to talk about his first author paper in New England Journal of Medicine, a randomized control stock trial called Stop It. And it was a trial of short course antimicrobial therapy for intra-abdominal infection. Dr. Sawyer, welcome. Thank you. Could you describe the patient population that Stop It trial applied to? Uh, well, these are patients with intra-abdominal infections and had to go through a process in terms of evaluation of entry into the study to make sure they had a procedure which achieved adequate source control, which is part of the whole key thing. So we're talking about patients who had an intra-abdominal infection and either had an operation or drainage which led to adequate source control. Uh, and then they would be randomized either into receiving just a fixed four-day course of antimicrobial therapy versus continuing their antibiotics until their fever or leukocytosis or other signs of sepsis and so forth resolve plus two days beyond that. So that, that, that's the patient population we're talking about, those who had an intra-abdominal infection with adequate source control. Can you give examples of what you meant by complicated intra-abdominal infection? Great. Uh, so the, there's actually an FDA definition for complicated okay. intra-abdominal infection, which is an intra-abdominal infection which requires an intervention to stop the ongoing contamination of the abdomen. Therefore, something like simple diverticulitis, which is just treated with antibiotics, um, uh, simple cholecystitis, uh, ischemic necrotic bowel without a perforation, uh, were excluded from the trial. Um, and therefore, complicated had to be, you had a perforation in a viscous somewhere that needed an operation. And appendicitis and cholecystitis also fit within that definition? Uh, no, appendicitis and cholecystitis were only included if there was a perforation in either gallbladder or the appendix, uh, and generally, uh, in the presence of positive cultures, we excluded simple cholecystitis and simple appendicitis. Really important for us to remember when we're applying the what 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 you show in your study. Was there a patient population that you that your findings did not apply to? Well, that's a great question, and in fact, uh, has been the source of many questions about the trial. The, our exclusion criteria were very narrow. It, we ended up including patients who had transplants, we included patients who had other forms of immunosuppression, we, there was no uh, limit to how critically ill you could be other than if we presumed you were going to be dead within 24 hours, then we didn't enroll you. Uh, and therefore we tried to have a very uh, broad and heterogeneous group. Now, the problem is, of course, as you get back, the number, total number of transplants we, the patients we had or the immunosuppressed patients we had is only in the 40 to 50 range, perhaps, out of the whole group. Uh, and therefore, can you uh, universally apply this? All I can say is the results seem to be the same across all forms of patients. Very sick, not very sick, uh, immunosuppression, no immunosuppression, and so forth. I, and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can by this pretty much any patient population. There is, uh, you know, at, at this meeting here at the Surgical Infection Society, um, multiple presentations specifically trying to address some of these uh, subgroups mm -hmm. out of the whole study. And, and we suffer, as everybody can imagine, from smaller and smaller group numbers. But uh, the effect, we think, has been very consistent across all the groups, meaning that the overall infectious outcomes are very similar whether you just got four days of antibiotics or more prolonged treatment. When I talk to people at the meeting, at the SIS meeting, they ask, why four days? And could you have reduced that even less? Yeah, so that's a great idea and a great question. The, um, the And I'm going to give you, uh, this is true, it's slightly humorous, but it's true. Uh, the recommendations when we were planning this whole trial uh, that the SIS had published was not based on real data, but three to five days of antibiotic therapy with good source control. And four just happens to be right in between three and five. So that's how we ended up with four. It's kind of a, it's a funny number, uh, but uh, it is, that's exactly how we derived it. And, and one of the things, and the, the question you ask is also very uh, reasonable, which is how about one day or two days or three days? Uh, that could well be possible. You know, particularly if you had, say, a very localized infection, say a simple abscess, uh, 
even if you have to operate on or put a grain in it. That probably would be fine as far as I'm concerned with just even shorter days of antibiotics, but that's for another study to figure out. As you alluded to, one of the tenets of your study was source control. Mm -hmm. So for the practicing surgeon, what does that mean? Does that mean microbiologically proven clearance? Does that mean that you have to take your first imaging and do a PCT to prove it's gone? Is it a white count fever? What is source control for the practicing surgeon? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and in fact, probably the most one of the most common questions I've received about this study, and it comes from both surgeons and actually radiologists get some who've contacted me, which is if you have somebody who you um, percutaneously drain at their first procedure, did you need to have a follow-up CT scan right. to prove that the, the uh, uh, abscess was completely drained or adequately drained and so forth? The short answer to the question is no, that was not a uh, requirement for the trial, and I would say uh, most patients did not have a follow-up um, study. But to get back to your original question about how you define source control and what that means, um, source control, generally speaking, means you have had some procedure which has either stopped or limited the ongoing contamination of the abdomen with the contents of a hollow viscous. Okay. Uh, for some things, that's an obvious uh, thing. So if you have a perforated appendix, you do your appendectomy, you have a nice clean staple line and so forth, uh, that's pretty obvious. If you have an abscess, uh, let's say you have a perforated diverticulum and then you present with a pelvic abscess and that gets percutaneously right. drained, it's fairly uh, clear that you may still have a fistula, but as long as you have adequate control, meaning the stool is now going out of the body through the drain, uh, we consider that uh, adequate. Now the way the trial ran, patients were identified at one of the 23 centers involved by a uh, local principal investigator, they had to believe there was adequate source control based on either discussions with the surgeon who performed the operation, uh, and then they would contact me in one of seemingly half a dozen electronic manners and give me a short scenario, and the two of us had to agree that there was adequate source control uh, before the patient was enrolled. So we had a, a, a little bit of a check and balance going on there to make sure that at least two uh, surgeons agreed. So then to, to broaden the applicability to a large number of practicing surgeons, would you favor heavily physiologic criteria, heart rate, white cell count, or would you really advocate that the larger scale should be an imaging study? Um, I, or is, is the well, data even there yet? Well, so the, the part, of the whole, part of the whole point of the study was to confirm, I think, or help confirm a statement that John Marshall, one of our great fathers in this uh, society uh, said very long ago, I think this was, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago at the meeting in Pittsburgh. I don't know if you're, that one, that was like ancient history. And he got up and he was in a symposium having to do with source control. Uh, and he said, once you have source control, all the other stuff is a response, a residual response to inflammation and doesn't matter. Uh, therefore, that's why interested in the fixed, day, fixed four day course of therapy and you stopped your antibiotics, if you still, even if you have still had a fever, leukocytosis and so forth and so on. And therefore my conclusion from the study in my own practice is uh, it, we stop your antibiotics after four days and then let's say five, six, seven days later you have a residual sign of an infection. Mm -hmm. That is an indication not for more antibiotics but for imaging and our next step would be imaging under those circumstances. If you think you either have a current infection or failed source control or, or whatever. So this is one of my, my, my favorite things, one of my favorite uh, pleas is uh, if you're five days after your intra-abdominal infection source control procedure and you still have a fever and leukocytosis, that is not an indication for more antibiotics. That is an indication for diagnostic uh, yes. interventions. So to expand on that, and kind of one of the questions Rachel asked you was, is there a patient population in whom you have a certain duration to get source control that would prohibit you from applying the short course? So if it took you two days versus seven days to get open source control, should did those patients fall out or do you think they would equally apply to the study? Uh, the, I'll have to answer that question with a um, statement or two about how the protocol was run. We did have some patients who 
say were operated on in a damage control mode. So they got operated on the first time for an intra-abdominal infection. The abdomen was left open. The rules of the trial were your days of antibiotics started when you had closed the abdomen and were convinced you had complete source control. So there were some patients who had, say, one or two operations before they technically started their four-day clock. Gotcha. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a legitimate way to look at it. That was just right. the way we, we uh, um, ran the study. So how do you think this might apply to other specialties? The infective vascular graft, exciting you know, bone or a neurosurgical patient with intracranial abscess. Do you think the same principles apply? Yes, I, I do. I certainly don't have the data to uh, support saying that people should go ahead and uh, practice in that mean way, but the concept of once you have adequate source control uh, and you have somebody uh, who's had antibiotics, there's going to be a residual inflammatory response which should abate over time uh, is important. Some of the exciting areas, uh, as you can probably guess, I'm an advocate of decreasing exposure to antibiotics and one of the ways to do that is to shorten courses of therapy is even in the traditionally um, vexing infections, say bloodstream infections and so forth and so on, there is a push in several quarters to try to even start studying those patients and say maybe five days of antibiotics for a bloodstream infection. I think in certain specific situations, like if you really have an infected graft and you still have communication with the bloodstream, that's still gonna be a vascular infection. They're probably gonna get six weeks of antibiotics or uh, osteomyelitis. Dr. Sawyer, on behalf of the Surgical Infection Society, we want to thank you for taking the time to be able to share with us the insights of your study, the Stoppage Trial. So thank you very much. Landmark study, and we're really lucky to have you.